what was a law of righteousness. Was it the Ten Commandments? Was it the laws of God? Why did God send the twelve tribes in tranches, that is, first the ten tribes? Why did he send them off into captivity? For rebellion and disobedience, right? You read that, Second Kings. Okay. What was a law of righteousness? Okay. Let's see. Okay, let's come back to Mark 7. Hold your place here, because we'll come back. Mark 7, verse 1. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes from Jerusalem. Now, boy, from Jerusalem. Hey, you're an important dude. Okay. Came together to him. And when they saw some of his disciples eating with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. Okay? For the Pharisees and all the Jews holding fast the traditions of the elders. That is a law of righteousness. The traditions of the Jews. Do not eat unless they wash their hands thoroughly. Even when coming from the market, they do not eat unless they first wash themselves. How are you going to do that if you're coming home with a nice basket of strawberries that the flavor is just coming right up and you're just drooling, you know, and you want to drink and you, you, you want to eat, you think, oh, I haven't washed my hands. If you eat it, you're sinning. Okay. <laughs> and there are many other things that they have received to observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and tables. For this reason, the Pharisees and scribes questioned him, why don't your disciples walk according to the tradition of the elders? Okay. Because it's not the way of the Lord, that's why. But he bred with unwashed hands. And he answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy concerning you hypocrites? Now what is a hypocrite? A sanctimonious pretender. And the Democrat Party and all religions are filled with it. Okay? As it is written, This people honors me with their lips. Israel did not attain to a law of righteousness. Didn't we just read that? Why? Because they honor him with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. Okay? Yet they think they're doing good. See, because God has given all of us free moral agency. We have to choose. All of you are here because we sent out an invitation and you chose to come. Okay? And we're glad you did. And we set the schedule for me to come down here for the 13th of July. So we're here. We chose to come. Okay? Same way with the commandments of God. Do we choose to do them? That's the question. So we'll answer it here in just a minute. Now notice verse 7. But in vain. Now what is, what is every human being and his or her best self? Vanity. Vanity. Men after one way, women after another way. Some are in between or all messed up. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. 
that is a law of righteousness. For leaving the commandments of God, isn't that what they do? Did we talk about the first half? God says, these are my appointed feasts which you shall keep in their seasons, right? Men come along and say, we're no longer going to keep them. They're rejecting the commandments of God to keep their tradition, right? Whatever the tradition is, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Buddha, you know, cannibalism, whatever. Okay. But in vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men, for leaving the commandments of God, you hold fast the traditions of men. So there you have it. Such as the washing of pots and cups, and you practice many other things like this. Now, if you don't have the book, Judaism, Revelation of Moses, or Religion of Men, will send it to you. There are thousands and thousands of Jewish traditional law that are incredible. And they never come to the knowledge of the truth of God because they have their own traditions. Now look at it today. Perfect example. Beginning with, I'm going to hear a new Dr. Martin. Quite a few. He worked with Professor Mazar over at the Jerusalem Dick. And it became very obvious that where the Mosque of Omar is, where the Western Wailing Wall is, that that's not where the temple was. That was the Roman Fort Antonio. And that the temple was to the south. Okay. So, that's where the Gion Spring is. That's where the spring for the temple. Okay. But now it's not running very much water. Okay. Other people have discovered through history, through reading, through everything else, that's where the temple should be. And they've told the Jews over and over and over and over and over again, that's where it should be. Why won't they listen? Two reasons. Number one, because it's not time yet to build it. They got a lot of things ready. It's not time. Number two, the Jew Orthodox will never take the word of an intellectual correctly intellectual Gentile on anything concerning Jewish matters. Perfect example of rejecting the commandments of God that you may keep your own tradition. Okay. All right. Now then, let's come back to Romans 9 again. Let's pick it up in verse 30. Okay. What then shall we say that the Gentiles who did not follow after righteousness have attained righteousness, even the righteousness by faith? Now let's understand something else. In order to keep the commandments of God, you have to have faith. Those who don't keep the commandments of God don't have any faith. What did Jesus say in John 14, 15? He said, if you love me, keep the commandments, namely mine. And he was the Lord God of the Old Testament. So that's all of them. Okay. So they believed and followed by faith. But Israel, they followed after a law. What does the King James say there? What do you have a King James? The law. The is not there in the Greek. That makes a real important difference, doesn't it? 
a law, tradition. So the faithful version has the correct translation. Now let's read on. Did not attain to a law of righteousness because you can't keep all the commandments and thousands that they have. Okay. Why? Why? That's the astonishing thing that people don't understand. God gave the commandments to all 12 tribes. The 10 went after Baal and were exiled. Judah stayed and was exiled and went to Babylon and came back. And they didn't learn the lesson. By the time Jesus comes, they don't even understand who he is. Okay. <coughs> Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. You have to keep the law by faith. Why do you keep the Sabbath? Because God, who is true and right and loving and kind and holy, also to the wicked, vengeful, and will destroy, he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And that's the commandment that men forget and reject. Now, if it involved money, and God said, remember where I put the treasure. Yes, Lord, I'll never forget. <laughs> okay. But when he says, remember the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is the key to understanding the Bible and understanding God and understanding salvation, so you will end up with more treasure than just the treasure on earth. Okay. But by the works of the law. That's what the King James says, right? That is absolutely a false. A first year student in New Testament Greek could prove that. There is no the before works, and there is no the before law in the Greek. It is works, plural, of love. Now, doesn't that make a big difference? See? They didn't even have the translator's ethical honesty of when you add a word for clarification to put it in italics. Okay. But by works of law, for they stumbled at the stone of stumbling. Exactly as it is written, Behold, I will place in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, but everyone who believes in him shall not be ashamed. When we read in Mark 7 about the traditions of the elders, was that not a repudiation of the traditions? No. Michael reminds me that there are some that are according to the laws of God. That's fine. Okay. But many are not. Okay. So that is a repudiation of, by Jesus of the works of men. Did God repudiate all the works of the Gentiles with their idols, with their religions, with their philosophies? Yes, he did. That's why it says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. All men in their own righteousness, regardless of what it is, cannot improve upon the righteousness of God. And the righteousness of God comes by loving him and keeping his commandments. Okay. So let's read on. Chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, the earnest desire of my heart and my supplication to God for Israel is for salvation. For I testify of them 
that they have a zeal of God. Weren't they doing all of these in the name of God? Name of the tradition? Name of the learned people? Zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And that is not according to the knowledge of God. The knowledge that God gave them, they weren't using. They were using their own carnal minds and thoughts. We create this law, okay? For example, when is sundown? Oh, sundown starts about three in the afternoon. Ask another Jew. Sundown starts when you see three stars at night. Now, when you read the Day of Atonement, it tells you, if you don't keep it, you're cut off from God. Right? What if one started at 3 in the afternoon and one 7.30 at night when he saw three stars? Who's right? Neither. Because God said, didn't want anyone to have a mistake about it. Leviticus 23.32, you shall observe this Sabbath, that is Day of Atonement, from sundown of the ninth to sundown of the tenth. That's the righteousness of God. All of the others are opinions. Okay. Verse 3, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God. Now what makes you ignorant of God's way? We're going to see it coming when they leave God's truth for the traditions of men. To establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. They didn't choose to do what God said. And remember the three most important words? Voice. That's it. See? What it, we'll see what Jesus said in a bit. The King James says, For Christ is the end of the works of the law. Doesn't it? Any italics there? No. Okay. Christ, here's the correct translation, because what are we talking about all the way through? The righteousness of God versus the righteousness of men. If you come to Christ and believe in faith, what are you going to do with the righteousness of men? The righteousness of their works of law. You're going to forsake them, right? Okay. For Christ is the end of works of law for righteousness. Not the works of the law, but works of law. Traditions and teachings of men. That's what is ended. Now what else ends? What else ends? following the traditions of men for the substitutes of the laws of God. Look at the world today. Now this year, we're going to end Feast of Tabernacles just a little before Halloween. And then comes Christmas and ooh, you know, you come up to someone who really, you know, Let's just choose um, Sean Hannity. Okay? He's a big Christmas guy. Walk up and say, did you know that Christmas is pagan and it's not of God and you need to repent and quit keeping it? Boom! <laughs> that comes to an end, you stop it. What do you do then? You keep the Passover to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And you keep the Sabbath. You keep the Holy Days of God. And what do all of these things do for us? 
they teach us God's plan, right? So when people come along and say we're no longer keeping them, they're saying we're taking you away from God. Now, why don't you follow us because we're so good? Let's come to Ephesians, the first chapter. And let's see what loving God, keeping his commandments, living in grace. Now, you have to have the grace of God in order to keep the commandments of God. The grace of God is your standing before God. See? And what is that? Come to chapter 2. We'll come there first. Chapter 2. Okay. Ephesians 2, verse 16. Now here's what it is for us every day. See? Every day. Verse 16, that he might reconcile both, that is Jew and Gentile, to God in one body through the, Christ, through the cross, having slain the enmity by it, the enmity of the rules of men. Now when he came, he preached the gospel, peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him, now notice this, and this is why we pray. And our prayers go to God. And he hears them and he answers them. Okay. For through him, we both have direct access by one spirit to the Father. That's why. Anyone who's a minister, or elder, or teacher, you teach always pointing to Jesus Christ and the Father. Not to anything else. Because God has given through his grace every single one of us direct access to God the Father in heaven above. Now think of that. Think of that. Think how important that is. And it's all through the sacrifice of Christ. So you compare that relationship with the traditions of men. There's no comparison. Okay, let's go on. Verse 19, so then you are no longer aliens or foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are being built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building being conjointly fitted together is increasing into a holy temple of God. And that will be at the resurrection. See? This is why, as we have pointed out, the most important thing is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and being. And you need to pray about that every day. I do, because people can get wrapped up in their own importance or down on themselves because of the trials and difficulties they're going through. See? To love God. That's what he wants. That's how he runs his kingdom. That's how he wants his church run. And we're to love each other how? How are we to love each other? Now, you all have to admit that all of us, for each one of us, may be a little tough to love, huh? Okay? That's why God has brought us together so that you can learn to love when it's tough. Okay? And have love and mercy and forgiveness and help and all of this sort of thing. Okay? And you also being built up together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Now, Hold your place in Ephesians 1, and we'll come right back. But hold a marker there and come to John 14. Okay? Now, you've heard me say these are the most important verses in the New Testament, and that probably is true. John 14. 
Let's pick it up here in verse 21. Okay? The one who has my commandments and is keeping them. Present tense participle. Meaning always, 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 always keeping. That is the one who loves me. So look at it the other way. We'll see that in a minute. And the one who loves me shall be loved by my father. Notice direct access to the father and the father loves you. The father himself. Okay. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how, what has happened that you're about to manifest yourself to us, but not to the world? How's that going to be, Lord? He said, I'm going away. So how are you going to manifest yourself? By God's spirit. See, That's the important thing. So he answered, verse 23, if, there's that word, free choice. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. That's his whole message. And the Father will love him, and we, we, the Father and the Son, that's the two parts of receiving the Holy Spirit. The Father for begettle to be a son or daughter of God and the Spirit of Christ to develop the mind of Christ. We will come and make our abode with him. That's something. Dwelling in you, the earnest of the Spirit of God. The completeness of the Spirit of God will be at the resurrection. Now notice, verse 24, the one who does not love me does not keep my words. What does that say about all those people who change it? And there are other churches of God that have difficulties and problems too. So pray for them because God has to deal with them. Okay? The one who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So what is happening when you reject the commandments of God and don't keep them? You're rejecting God the Father. Okay? Now I'll come back to Ephesians 1. Because Paul tells us how important that all the brethren of the God of God are, every single one of us, and how important it is that we teach the truth of God. Because God the Father wants a direct relationship with each one of us, where all the saints are, wherever they are. And he can do that because he's God. Right? All right. Verse 1, Ephesians 1. Paul, an apostle to Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints, that is, the holy ones, that's us, who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. A prophecy. Going down through time. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think of that. That's to you. The grace of God to you, the peace of God to you. And from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly things with Christ. Now that includes everything that God is going to give us at the resurrection. Okay? We don't have it all yet, but we have some of it, right? Yes. Verse 4, according as he has personally chosen us for himself. Now I want you to think on that. That God personally 
has chosen each and every one of us for himself. For himself. Before the foundation of the world, that means in his plan that he had before the foundation of the world, in order that we might be holy and blameless before him in love. That's what God wants. Okay? That's what's important. Having predestinated us for sonship, be his sons and daughters. Magnificent. What is that going to be? Okay. Through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us objects of his grace, and this indeed the beloved son. Now you see, when we take these words and let these words be etched in our mind, in our spirit, and things that we that God has given us, think how we are able then to do the things that please God. Now this doesn't mean you won't have trials or tests. But it gives you the strength spiritually so that whatever you have to go through, God will see you through it. And think of all the martyrs that willingly went singing hymns as they were on their way to be burned at the stake and be beheaded. They had that in their minds because they had the word of God. And actually, they had thousands and thousands of more who had the Holy Spirit of God that are then that are in the churches of God today. There's one account of 800,000. See, so when God says he has a work he's doing, he's not out there doing it with tinker toys. Okay? He's doing it with his spirit. And God has given us all of these things for us to grow in grace and knowledge and overcome. Okay? Verse 7. In whom we have redemption in, through his blood, even the remission of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he has made to abound toward us in all wisdom and intelligence, having made known to us the mystery, the secret of God. And the secret of God is contained in loving God, keeping his commandments, the Sabbath and holy days, and God's plan to unfold. Okay? Made known to us according to his good pleasure which he proposed in himself. So that's quite a thing, isn't it, brother? Well, this is why we're here. This is why God called us. This is why every day is a new day. Take it and use it. Problems and difficulties you have, pray about them, overcome them. If you're coming to a situation where then you know somewhere down the road, it's going to be your last sleep. Well, you'll be resurrected. See? That's the important thing. And God loves you. God cares for you. God wants you. And we need to respond back to God spiritually, each one of us, with prayer and study and yieldedness to him. So that's what we have to cover when we find news like we found today. I had my other sermon already, but I didn't do that one. Okay? So, we'll close services, have a final hymn, and everybody move their stuff out of the way because we're going to have a feast.